It's lovely to see so many of you here tonight. My name is James, I'm the events manager here at Gwee Books, and it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of the store and, of course, also on behalf of New South Books. Before we begin tonight's proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. It's upon their ancestral lands that Gwee Books is built. Now, I'll keep my other introduction short tonight because I'm sure that the two men beside me need no introduction. George Williams A.O. is the Dean, the Anthony Mason Professor and a Scienter, uh, Scienter Professor at the Faculty of Law, UNSW. He has written 35 books, including a Charter of Rights for Australia, which is now in its fourth edition, and of course, we're celebrating here tonight. He'll be in conversation with the Honourable Michael Kirby. One of Australia's longest serving judges, Michael has had a distinguished career serving on the High Court as the, uh, on the High Court as the UN Special Representative for Human Rights in Cambodia and as a member of the UNAIDS, uh, UNAIDS uh, Reference Group on HIV and Human Rights. We're very glad to have both of them with us here tonight. There's going to be a Q&A after the talk, but we've had a slight hiccup uh, with our usual setup. Our Roby microphone is broken, so if you do have a question, I ask that you... <laughs> That's one option. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so if you do have a question, uh, we will uh, uh, point to you, or Michael will, will be the moderator. Uh, and when he points to you, if you would please stand up and project your question, that will help us to make sure everyone hears you. Uh, aside from that, as always, we ask that you keep your questions respectful and concise. Now, without further ado, George, uh, uh, George Williams and Michael Kirby. It's always a great thing to be at Glee Books and uh, this wonderful facility. I was here once doing what I'm doing tonight uh, and suddenly uh, the whisper went around the room, Mr. Rudd was downstairs, he was expecting <laughs> all the books here. And, uh, we didn't lose many from our audience but uh, it's a good thing to know that Mr. Rudd uh, is a habitué here at Glee Books. And uh, I think it's, if not the best, certainly one of the best bookshops in the nation. Uh, I welcome Professor George Williams, who is a truly remarkable Australian, uh, an outstanding scholar, 35 books, as has been said. Um, he had an upbringing in St Ives, or at least he went to St Ives Public High School. So he's a product of public education, as I am. And, uh, he, he went on to um, Macquarie University, where I was the Chancellor at the time, and uh, where I'm, uh, I'm a star or semi-star in the uh, photograph of George when he got his uh, first degrees. And then um, he went uh, to become the associate to Justice, uh, uh, Justice Michael McHugh, a Justice of the High Court of Australia, in a glorious year, 1992. It was the year of the decision in the Marbo case and a year in, uh, of the decision in the implied free speech case uh, and many other important cases of that year. And uh, it's an appropriate thing to start our conversation by asking him to take us back to that time. I just missed out on that time because I arrived in the High Court in 1996 when there was, shall we say, different, under different management. <laughs> but that year was a glorious time and it must have been great to be alive in the High Court of Australia in that year. Tell me about it. Tell me everything about it. Well, I'm sorry, Michael, that you missed out on that era, but thank you for your generous introduction and the honour you do me by uh, appearing with me tonight. And thank you, everyone, for coming to talk about these issues. I mean, you're right. It was 1992, and I was straight out of law school. I was 23 years old, and I'd never practised law, but I found myself working for Michael McHugh in the High Court. And indeed, one of the very first cases I got to work on as associate was the Marbo case. And, uh, my job there was to help with the research, to make sure that the judgment was in order. And after that came these remarkable cases where the High Court for the first time discovered that this old arcane document, the Constitution, could bear the implication of human rights, could actually respect and build in protections for freedom of speech. And it was a time unlike, I think, any other period on the High Court. And uh, 
it was a time I know Michael that if you had been there that it would have been such a wonderful era because of the way it resonated with your own views on the court afterwards but it was a time when I think the judges really were exploring the possibilities of how our system could deliver justice and human rights within the framework that it had and uh, you'd have to say it was a very atypical uh, time for our High Court and uh, I'm not sure we've seen anything like it since. There was a very important passage uh, in the principal uh, reasons with which your judge agreed, Justice Brennan's reasons about um, the, the why you, we could not in the common law just go on with the old um, facile approach that the Aboriginal people were nomadic um, and uncivilised and uh, there was that passage where he said if there's one universal principle that has been adopted by the community of nations it is that you cannot uh, you cannot deny people fundamental rights by reason of their race and so that was really a, a very overt appeal to first of all human rights and secondly to international human rights uh, what did you think of that when that first came under your scrutiny? Well, it, it said to me that uh, as, a, as a nation we should be open to international influences when it comes to understanding we can do things better, that we shouldn't be this parochial nation that says we know what's best, that in fact we should recognise that when it comes to international instruments, for example, there's a lot we can learn, we have a lot we can learn from other countries. And the Marbo case was obviously a landmark in that regard. It, it enabled us to see our history differently that instead of us being a nation of terra nullius, that meant that we could deny a key part of the population their most basic rights, in fact even deny their existence, is what the law did. That when we looked internationally, that the base injustice of that became quite apparent. And uh, sometimes you need that external perspective, I think, to understand just how wrong some things are. But I think what's sad about that era and what happened since is that for much of the time since, uh, many judges in our court have been trying to move away, of course, from that approach. And uh, it was really the high point, rather than it being the start of a great journey of opening up our system, of reimagining what justice can be in Australia. I think since then, we've had a number of governments who have furiously tried to appoint people to make sure that we don't go down that path. And uh, we've returned in many ways to the more parochial system that we had before. Can I ask you a question that I asked Barry Jones where, when he sat here, when he produce one of his wonderful books. Uh, your upbringing, your parental values, your uh, school experience and so on, do you think that they made you more open to this, given that the Australian legal profession and judiciary on the whole has been pretty resistant to the notion of human rights? And I want to get to why that is so, but just in your own experience, Barry put it down, he was quite open about his Methodist upbringing and he thought that had a very big impact on is thinking as a sort of humanist Christian. Uh, yeah. What about yourself? Look, I, I think so. I mean, if I look back at my own upbringing, it was a. Uh, I mean, there were certainly some very difficult times as a child, where uh, I lived in a family where uh, I had a single mother, and uh, it was a family that was very poor for large periods of time, and uh, it certainly gave me an appreciation, particularly of the power of education. I and mean, as now a professor of constitutional law, I'm a product of our public education system. And there is no capacity that I could have gone to university but for the fact that at that time I was able to do so and it was open to people of talent and we chose people based upon their potential and the opportunity they might realise. And uh, in any other system that didn't have such an open capacity for public education, I undoubtedly would have been one of the kids who missed out um, on achieving what I've been able to achieve. I think that's one factor, an empathy and a sympathy that comes with understanding that if you come from the wrong side of the tracks, and my family is from Tasmania as well, and that's surely another mark. My goodness. Well, yes, so uh, if you think of a Tasmanian family coming from a you single parent family... You kept that very quiet. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> and uh, in terms of a religious component in your upbringing, was there a religious component or not? Well, there was, but it, it did fall by the wayside, oh, I, I have to say. That, yeah. uh, and I think, again, it, my family was a, a strong Catholic family, but uh, when my parents divorced, the fact that there was some ostracisation involved here, <laughs> my mother was no longer welcome. I mean, that sent a pretty strong signal to me as a child about uh, you know, inclusiveness, and it turned me away, I think, from what otherwise may have been a more religious upbringing. But, of course, again, the public school system um, 
gave me opportunities and opened my eyes in a way that perhaps a more defined religious education might not have done. And you went on to be a solicitor in Blake Dawson Water, one of the top end of town uh, cup firms. And uh, you then went to the ANU and you uh, taught there for a while. And then quite early you went to UNSW and became a, a professor, a Sir Anthony Mason professor. And um, what took you into the academic as distinct? Because pretty obviously you would have been an absolutely top barrister. You are very, very quick and very uh, articulate. So why didn't you take the golden path of barrister, <laughs> QC, judge? Uh, what drew you to teaching and scholarship? Well, I must have been I'm revisiting my career choices. Um, <laughs> so, look, it's a good question because, in fact, uh, I always thought I would be a barrister. And when I was at university, in fact, I looked to you, Michael, as one of the people in the profession who I really admired and said that someone arguing in court, what an exciting thing to do to appear on behalf of people, to fight for justice, to argue on behalf of people who don't have a voice. And uh, that was always my intention. And after working in the High Court as an associate, I was even more minded to do it. But uh, in fact, it was Michael McHugh who talked me out of it. And it was at a point when the bar was at a low ebb. And uh, he just thought, you can't make money at this point. This is not a good point. And this job in academia came up. And I thought, well, why not get better? I go for a couple of years and I've never quite escaped it. But equally what I've discovered is the beauty of academia is the, the flexibility and so I still practice as a barrister and have been very lucky to be arguing for Aboriginal people in the Hindmarsh Island Bridge case before yourself and others or in Plaintiff S1, in S157, a key case in representing asylum seekers or in other cases for the media. So I have a, a niche practice on behalf of often those who need support in court it doesn't make a lot of money, but it's really fulfilling. And uh, that combined with my restless desire to change the law, I think is a good, ma a good match for me. Uh, and um, you have um, appeared and continue to appear, uh, and some, bar some professors have done this. Patrick Kaiser does it. Uh, Dyson Hayden in uh, his earlier time um, mixed it uh, a bit, but it, it hasn't been so common, really, has it? But it does give... Uh, people a really good grasp of what cases are really about and what influences the decisions? Well, there's nothing like a, a good sense of the mechanics of the law to both open your eyes to the possibilities <coughs> and the limitations of it. And I mean, a good example of that is a case I did uh, a couple of years ago where we were representing the asylum seekers on Manus Island in PNG and in the Australian High Court were arguing that that surely was unconstitutional, that kids and others would be held in circumstances where the court could see it was harsh and inhumane, it was arbitrary detention, they could be held indefinitely, they could be returned to the country from which they were fleeing, there was no guarantee that kids would even receive a decent education, women would receive good health care, and it was real eye-opener, even at this late stage of my career, that the response of the court was, but what's the legal problem with that? Um, we can accept all of those things, but why is that a problem under Australia's legal system? And indeed, going back to some cases in your time as well, Michael, when the court recognised at that point that children can be detained uh, in potentially harsh circumstances and in the famous, infamous Alcatep case that any person could be detained indefinitely by virtue of our laws, even where there's no suggestion they've committed a crime, but purely because of their status that they're stateless and there's nowhere to which they can be returned. And just can I ask a footnote on that issue because there is a suggestion that the numbers are building up in the current High Court to get to a point where if detention by the executive government or under a power made by Parliament goes on for too long, then it will turn from being detention into a form of punishment which can only be imposed by the judges under Chapter 3 of the Constitution. Now, that is something which Justice Gordon uh, mentioned in, I think it's AB, uh, plaintiff uh, AB, uh, and I think Justice Gagler has hinted it and Justice Bell, but it's something Justice McHugh told me in my first week in the High Court. He said, there's one rule you've got to know in this place. And I was wide-eyed and I said, what can that possibly be, Michael? And he lifted up his hand, four. You have to have four justices. And if you can get the four, you can make a majority and have a binding rule of the court. And that will become part of the law of the land. 
And I don't think we've got four on that principle yet. <laughs> or have we? No, I don't think we do. And uh, it says a lot about where we are, that there are, there are the seeds of great possibilities in these sorts of areas, that perhaps the court would discover some really basic and fundamental protections, such as that you, you can't be detained without being found guilty of a crime, or that you can't be detained in circumstances that are harsh and not very humane. But every time the court gets close to it, it, it backs off. And it's had the opportunity a number of times in these cases. But faced with the enormous political pressure, I think, of parliaments in this area to legislate and to have their way, uh, where courts have had options, bar a few judges here or there, uh, we, we just don't have the judges at the moment. I think with the courage or desire to decide in this way. And what it means is if we want change, we need political change. We really can't rely upon the judges. It's not really their role or their possibility to do this. And we can't abdicate to them our responsibility as citizens, I think, to actually see some of these things altered. Why um, have the politicians not been willing to take the step of, that you urge in this book of uh, creating on a federal level what you were able to persuade the Victorian government in 2005 to create on the state level for the first time a charter of rights and responsibilities. Now, why uh, sometimes, you know, you can't say this is just the coalition and uh, the Labor Party is there restless to do this matter for human rights because Bob Carr was one of the, the strongest, fiercest and most articulate opponents of, uh, of uh, a human rights law. Now, why is this so? Why do both of the main political groupings in Australia have common cause on this issue? Well, I think what's interesting about this is they're just all over the place, both parties. So in fact, you find some very strong supporters of better protection for human rights within the coalition. And if you think who has championed free, better free speech protection in Australia, even over that really disturbing debate over Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, well, very often in this day and age, it's very conservative figures saying we need better protection for freedom of speech. And they've actually started to wake up to the fact that our system does not protect something even as basic as that. Uh, but when it comes to why it hasn't happened, um, every Labor government in office since World War II has tried to bring about some form of national bill of rights or protection, whether it be in the constitution or legislation. Every Labor government since World War II has failed to do that. Uh, most recently, the Rudd government set up an enormous national process. It had over 40,000 submissions, amnesty, get up, a range of groups were heavily involved. It was e extremely successful. Father Frank Brennan led it. He was a critic, but he was converted after hearing the stories about the need for this change. And uh, it was delivered to Parliament, and uh, the Labor government imploded. Now, why? Uh, why? What's the explanation? Well, I suppose, why did Kevin Rudd go bad? What happened to that government? <laughs> because, of course, it was not driven by this issue at all. In the same week that they dropped their commitment to a National Human Rights Act, the same week they said we're not going to move on climate change. Yeah. So in fact, it, there were about four or five things, iconic things in that week that they said we need to take a shift to the right. And this was one of those things that they said, well, we've just gone through 18 months, 40,000 people, we've got the model, it's ready to go in <coughs> Parliament. But they changed, of course, Kevin Rudd lost his job soon afterwards. In fairness, they postponed. They said that they would introduce a measure which would allow for parliamentary scrutiny and report on human rights implications of federal bills. But they said, we will look at this again in 2015, I think, and uh, 2015 came and went. And, and they, they were, were gone, in office. of course, by the, but that's right. And it, and it does show that that's why the, book, the timing of this book is important, because Labor said in 2010, we're not saying no, we're going to try just to see if scrutiny by Parliament works. So keep the courts out, let's see if Parliament, a bit like the fox guarding the hen house, can itself <laughs> ensure that it doesn't breach human rights. And a recent survey I did looked at how often laws are being enacted, and it was done with Daniel Reynolds, who's my co-author on this book, and we found that the rate at which the Federal Parliament is breaching basic rights has never been higher. It's an accelerating graph particularly for things as basic as free speech. So the idea of Parliament checking itself, I mean, look, it's, a, it's an abject failure. Um, so when Labor gets back into office, there's plenty of evidence to say, well, you said no last time because you had an alternative. You said you'd come back to this if it wasn't working. Well, it's not. And the ALP platform has within it that they will move on a Charter of Rights once they've reviewed the current system. And uh, I don't know about you, but I don't see much evidence there that it's working effectively for a lot of people to protect basic entitlements. 
Now this book is the, a reprint essentially with a lot of additions and, and changes of an earlier text. Um, and I get a feeling that this is like last year in Mariam Bud, you and I have been talking about these issues for the whole of the period of this book. And tell me about uh, the changes that have come in this book and what it is that inspires you to think that anything more or different is going to happen today. Well, I think, uh, I mean, as you know, Michael, I think to get any reform in Australia, you've got to be both an optimist and persistent. And perhaps a little blind sometimes to the difficulties involved in getting change. And, and look, there are very few changes in Australia that I think you achieve in this area without just some absolute persistence. And, and for me, that's one of those issues that uh, this will happen at some point. Australia is the only democracy in the world that has not done this. Um, the reason we haven't well, done hang it... hang on. There's, there's the Sultanate of Brunei and, <laughs> yes, and, the, right. and the Holy See of the Vatican. Yep. And that's it. That's it. Well, that's right. And that's hence, what you uh, say in the book. That's right. And then we actually look through all of those countries and hence, you know, non-democracies. So there is no country that has not done this. And there's just no good reason Australia hasn't. But when we've had Labor and power, they've botched it, essentially. Mismanagement. And if you take the attempt in the 80s that the Hawke government made... On that occasion, the numbers were there. The Democrats and the Senate were prepared to agree. And what happened on that occasion was Brian Burke from Western Australia, the Premier, actually said to Bob Hawke, you can't put that through. It'll affect our gerrymandered electoral boundaries in Western Australia. And a deal was done. It was pulled from the Senate before the Democrats and Labor could vote on it. And so these are the sort of stories that are saying, well, why hasn't it got up? Base political reasons um, that have nothing to do with the nature of the change. Well, how did you get it up in Victoria? That's what we all want to know. Uh, I mean, you were appointed, I assume it must have been by Mr Hulls, was it? That's right, Rob uh, Hulls. He's yeah. a very good man. You know, he's now working, as you probably know, on the issue of um, brain damage to people who suffer violence. And uh, about a third of prisoners in Australian prisons suffer from mental illness caused by actual physical brain damage. And, the, uh, our, our prison population is expanding very rapidly at great cost to the taxpayer, and he's pointing out in his new work in an academic role that this is often bound up with mental illness and with mental illness caused by violence. So he's a good guy. But how did you, I don't think you would have had too much trouble persuading him, but how did you persuade the Victorian Labor government to uh, introduce the Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Yeah, and responsibilities. It was, a, it was a great brief where I had a committee with myself and others, including Andrew Gaze, the Olympian, the basketballer. And, and I would say that having Andrew on that was part of the answer to this, that you actually need fewer lawyers and more sporting people. <laughs> <laughs> because in the end, it's about, it's about reaching out. And, and the strategy that, that I devised with the Victorian committee was, let's not talk to any of the people who are converted to this. Let's not talk to the civil liberties groups. So we went directly to the Country Women's Association. We went directly to our victims' rights groups. And we went to all of those groups who we felt would be interested, but maybe sceptical or even hostile. And particularly the police. By the end of the process, the biggest champions of the change in Victoria were Victoria Police. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it was announced, they stood up with the Premier and said, we want this because we know as police, we are the frontline agency in dealing with human rights every day for our members and for the people also the victims of crime and uh, we managed to convince them through a community process so when it got to the Labor cabinet they said well here are the groups we're sure against it and in fact the attorneys could say no we've consulted with them they actually think this can work this is the model that's right and so it went through cabinet and it became the first state bill of rights. It's a wonderful achievement that you made there and it ha does have a precedent because you may remember a ALRC uh, 2 on uh, criminal investigation uh, when we started drawing, back in 1975, a, a criminal investigation bill, the police were totally opposed to sound and video recording of confessions to police. But then when we talked to them and explained how this would be so valuable for their uh, prosecutions, um, and when they made their own inquiries about what was happening overseas, they came on board and they came to support it. But it was a long journey and persuasion was, was not all that easy. Well, and it's something we don't see as much of in public life these days in terms of the media cycle, the sustained opportunity to convince people of a reform, to educate, to work something through. And, and one of the tricky things in this area is there's so much misinformation in the community. And uh, 
I mean, one thing I did see in Victoria was when I went around the state, we went to all the rural and regional areas, we held about 150 meetings over about three months, often just in local town halls with the PNCs and others. And very often they would start with saying, well, this is about a Victorian Bill of Rights. We don't need it because we've got a national Bill of Rights. We don't need two in this country. And uh, a survey that Amnesty did a few years ago showed, in fact, that 61% of Australians think we do have a National Bill of Rights, which will confuse them. This book will really confuse them, uh, <laughs> given that. But when I was going around in Victoria saying to people, well, you've got the National Bill of Rights, what's in it? They would say freedom of speech is the thing that's the thing they know is protected. But the thing they came up with second most often was they said, I know if I'm in trouble in court, I can take the fifth. And of course, <laughs> it, it's not speaking well of myself and the educational establishment, but um, a majority of Australians think we've got the instrument this book is arguing for, and a large percentage of those think it's populated by material from US cop shows. Uh, but that is, that is where we are in this community, and if you want to debate, win a debate about this, and hence the reason for the book, you've got to educate, you've got to open minds, you've got to explain... Firstly, this instrument is not part of our system of government, and so often I get people coming to me from the community saying, I want some help legally, and you have to say, well, actually, you don't have the basic entitlements you think you do. Um, in fact, there's just, in, in our system, your rights exist to the extent often that politicians have decided not to take them away. When I go down to Victoria for conferences that involve the uh, Victorian Charter of Rights and Responsibilities, <coughs> Uh, some curious things come up. For example, Gemma Varley, who is the Chief Parliamentary Counsel down there, said, the great advantage of this is it stops litigation because we have to tick the bills as they come through that they are charter conformable. And that means that uh, many of the problems that might otherwise arise are dealt with on the, before the passage through Parliament. And where the, the, they, they override the charter, they've got to give an explanation for it if they don't agree with the Parliamentary Council's um, advice. But there's another reason that's often put down there, and that is that it's very useful in teaching children at school about fundamental principles by which they live together with others in, in society. So they are two main reasons. But what would you give as a percentage um, to the Victorian Charter for its actual operation? You know, no, I don't want to talk about what it was intended to do and its words, but has it actually on the ground been useful? Have the judges responded effectively to it, or have they been hostile? Well, I, I think actually almost the least effective part of the Victorian Bill of Rights, the Charter, is in the, is in the courts. I mean, there have been cases, it has made a difference, and very recently, for example, the courts have said that uh, children cannot be held in adult prisons. And that's a big decision, and it's a decision that's deeply inconvenient for the government, but it's driven an outcome down there, and that, that's one example. But almost all of the examples come at the prevention end. And when I was drafting the Victorian Charter, my view was that if it's got to court, you failed at that point, because it's too expensive, it means the harm has already been done, and so the real job to be done with these instruments is how do you actually stop parliaments enacting bad laws in the first place or making and implementing policies in ways that infringed dignity. And, and an example of the sort of thing that I was trying to achieve I actually took from the United Kingdom Human Rights Act where there it's an instrument again that's focused on how governments work. And uh, there was a, an elderly couple in a nursing home and they had been together for 62 years and the husband developed a back complaint and needed a special bed. And the nursing home said that, yes, you can have the special bed, but under our guidelines you're only entitled to a single bed. And by virtue of that, you'll have to be separated. In fact, the, the wife would move to a different nursing home. And they're in their 80s um, at this point. And they said, this is what our policy says. We're sorry. They offered to pay for a double bed themselves to meet the health needs of the husband. But again, they said, no, no, our guidelines don't, don't allow this. I'm sorry, you'll have to be separated uh, because of this. And they got some advice from a local advocate who said, well, the Human Rights Act in the UK provides for rights to privacy, family life, and the like. They pointed this out and the government changed its policy immediately. And they did because they were exposed. I mean, this was an arbitrary, cruel policy at a really vulnerable but important point in somebody's life. And, and that really inspired me to think that's what you do. You intervene at the point where people are often getting a raw deal from government officials who are making unthinking decisions that affect people's dignity and rights. You don't want people going to court. It's too low, too slow, too expensive. And the most powerful thing often to do is shame a decision maker
by virtue of a set of standards that says, well, we'll really buck up and get this right. And that's what we have seen in Victoria. I mean, good examples in Victoria include uh, particularly policies that led to people in public housing being evicted into homelessness, uh, where they had served a criminal sentence, they'd served their time, they were coming out and they discovered that they had been a former criminal and they were being evicted with their children into homelessness. And it was a cruel policy that was based upon because you had previously been in prison, your weighting within your right to housing was really low in the scale of things. And uh, the rights of kids were ignored as part of that, and, and that policy changed. Other areas are kids with disabilities, big shifts there, where more resources with kids on autism spectrum were, again, indefensible on medical grounds, but rights within the charter there have forced a rethink and changes to policies. So that's where it's been. It's actually had a big impact, and the Human Rights Law Resource Centre a few years ago put out a document called 101 Case Studies, which shows 101 cases that we just ordinary people have been able to use it to get outcomes that would not have been possible. And that for me is really what I hope for, you know, changing lives, making a difference for people, doesn't get publicity, it's not something that the media gets stuck into, it's not polarising, but decisions are changed. Why can't and, uh, you just leave it to Parliament to... This is what Mr. <laughs> with Mr. Mr. Carr used to always say, you've got to leave it to the elected representatives in Parliament. They'll fix all these things up. You don't want unelected judges deciding <laughs> those things. Well, and of course, you need the judges there as a check and a balance because, I mean, like anything in life, where you have unrestrained power and where you have political opportunism, it's not surprising what the outcome is. I mean, a good example we talk about in the book is Australia's anti-terror laws, where here we have this really wicked problem. I mean, community fear the opportunity for governments to hopefully secure their re-election by being tough on terror. And what's the result in Australia? We've had now 67 anti-terror laws enacted since September 11. And over the really busy period from 2001 to 2007, we averaged a new anti-terror law every six and a half weeks. And it was just extraordinary, the rate at which they were being passed. It was a race to the bottom. And uh, there's no other country, and I've studied them, that has done <coughs> this because those other countries had sets of checks and balances that held them back. And, uh, and so what you get in Australia is you get a permissiveness and a capacity to do things that are you know, really just unthinkable in other nations. And are there any recent cases where you think it would have made a difference if we had had, say, nationally, the type of legislation they had in Victoria that you persuaded them to adopt there? Well, yeah, I think there are many examples of that. I mean, a couple of recent ones are the law that was put into the Border Protection Act that said that if you witness, witness something in a detention centre in Manus Island in Nauru, and if you come back and tell someone about it, you can be jailed for two years. And of course that had applied to doctors and indeed could have led to journalists being jailed. Another example is a law that passed that enables ASIO to ignore the ordinary criminal law in carrying out its special intelligence operations. So it can operate outside of the legal system. And if, say, they kill someone, even by mistake, a journalist can be jailed for 10 years for reporting on even a misuse of power by ASIO. Or the Alcatep case, of course, back in 2004, that a federal law that permits people without charge or sentence to be detained indefinitely. I mean, these are so far outside of the pale of what we would expect, and so far outside of what our community expectations are of how our society and democracy should operate, that by and large people don't know about it. And, uh, but it's the explanation that's sometimes said about that. Well, we're basically a pretty good country. We've been put number 10 in the Economist list of democratic countries and horrible things. These are just spectres that are not really going to trouble us too much. And when they do, they'll be pretty horrible people if things are being done. You've got to have these in reserve. I've often heard that put up. What do you say about that? Well, I think you're right. It's a really powerful argument in Australia that these laws are directed to the other the outside of the danger and people find it very hard to put themselves in the shoes of someone who might be subject to one of these sorts of laws and if you can say this doesn't affect you I think in Australia there's a sad complacency that we all too easily fall into but it's pretty easy to fall into that when most people think we've got a Bill of Rights anyway and uh, indeed that's what I often find when I debate people or talk to community groups that they, they will say that in the end look the Parliament can do these things but we know that you know, the Bill of Rights will come into play if they go too far. So that's a really worrying system where, in fact, again, at the community level, there's an acceptance of these things because of a fictitious check and balance. Now, just three last questions. First of all, Daniel Reynolds, your co-author,
who I don't think was involved with the first uh, effort with this book. Um, you've told us something about what he did. He can't be here tonight. Uh, what was his role in the book so that we can give a tribute to him tonight? Yeah, and Daniel was uh, someone I've worked with closely for a number of years, and he's uh, you know one of our absolute best students from the University of New South Wales. And he can't be here tonight. He gives his apology because, like me, he uh, he's now an associate at the High Court, and uh, so he's probably busily getting ready for some dual citizenship cases. Assisting <laughs> his judge, or he's just finished That'll helping be a thrill. with. Well, yes, or he may be helping work on a judgment on the uh, postal survey case. So he has good reasons for not being here, but. Uh, my problem was now that I'm a dean, of course, that it's, time is an issue, but also I felt we needed a fresh perspective as well. And this was a book that's been around for some time. It's been very influential in achieving reform in Victoria. The ACT, Queensland, has just agreed they're going to introduce a charter in that state as well. And Will that uh, be modelled on the, on the Victorian it charter? It is. It's modelled on the... And uh, the Premier says legislation any day, and uh, that is, that's a key moment. If Queensland does this... It kickstarts the debate nationally. They, they've said they will do it, so we're waiting for the law. And uh, let's hope even New South Wales. We've got Jenny Leong here, for example, who's one of the champions in the New South Wales Parliament. And uh, maybe even this state one day can follow the lead of New South Wales, Queensland, and the ACT. And if you've gone through this so many times, and I've gone through it so many times, and it's easy to get dispirited about this issue. Um, do you feel a, a little more confident? Is the Queensland step um, putting a spring in your step? Do you think we're get, going to actually see some change or will we just go through our paces yet once again and nothing much will happen in Australia? Well, and of course, if we look at, say, the life of this book, and let's hope there is not a fifth edition of this book. Let, let's hope this is it, fingers crossed. Um, I mean, over the life of this book, we've gone when I started, well, about 20 years ago, writing in this area, that we had none of these instruments. Um, and we saw the ACT, we saw Victoria, now Queensland. I think what it says is that we, we've made enormous reforms in this area, but progress is very slow. And one of the key missing pieces at the federal level is the champion. Um, because the idea is there, the international experience is there, it's worked in the ACT in Victoria. But uh, what we need is particularly Mark Dreyfus, the Shadow AG, who has spoken strongly in favour of this. He was one of the big champions of this change during the Rudd government, sees it as a legacy issue. If Labor does win, we need leadership from him uh, to implement his own platform. But uh, to answer your question in a short form, Michael, it's the really surprising thing is this has not been done. As I say, every comparable country has. We are the outlier, and there's no particular reason... Yes, but we're the outlier on marriage equality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're the outlier on many things. We, we, and we do horrible things to refugees. And we, I think we're the only country that I know of that outsources the uh, holding of people in detention camps, which are, for the little evidence we actually can get about them, hell holes. So uh, we, we, are, we are not a good... Comply with the universal human rights, unfortunately. No, look, I agree, and of course, it hasn't always been that way. We're what, the second nation to give women the vote. Um, we have wonderful and strong democratic traditions that far exceeded the UK and other countries for their time. Uh, we also have one of the most successful multicultural nations in the world in terms of embracing other cultures and faiths. But somehow we seem to have gone off the tracks, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years, I think, and there are many symptoms of that. And uh, again, maybe it shows I'm an optimist in thinking that that's not a permanent set of affairs and that I think particularly people like myself, academics, people in universities have a responsibility to imagine a better possibility in these areas, not just accepting the way things are, but saying here are ways and changes we can make that might get us back to some of the good things that we treasure. Well, I think you'll agree that in George Williams we have a tremendously articulate person. He doesn't... You, you, you know, if you got that text that he's just said and put it, there would be full stops. There are <laughs> nouns and verbs and a couple of adjectives, not too many. It's really an amazing uh, performance. I remember a day in the High Court, it was a, the case of Patrick Palmer's, and it was a, quite a complicated case. And you were down there within about 10 minutes of the delivery of the judgment, and all the justices were there looking over the balcony uh, at uh, the scene below, and there you were in this melee of lawyers, of, uh, of journalists, 
and you were explaining a complex decision uh, within 10 minutes of it coming down and that was what the people of Australia got from that, that case. So uh, I think we, you helped the Victorians to take the step. You've never given up on the Feds. The Queenslanders are now hopefully going to take the step and you are full of optimism, brightness and light. And that's a great gift to Australia. Thank you very much, George. Williams.